Welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. Stacey Mencher. And our guest today is, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Carol Lovering, author of Tell Me Lies and the forthcoming Too Good to Be True, which is out in March. And uh, Stacey and I were super, <laughs> super lucky to get an ARC of it. Um, this episode will air around the time that the book is released. And I know that we're going to have a, um, a virtual program with you as well, which we're excited about. So um, excited. Yeah, so excited. Uh, it is great. I could not put it down. And much like Tell Me Lies, which um, Stacy introduced me to, <laughs> it was so well done. Yes. Um, yeah. I'm not done with Thank it. You. I'm still reading it, but I, I literally, that was one of the many reasons why I was slightly late to work today <laughs> is I just couldn't, I was like, I need to know more. I need to be in the lives of all of them. Oh, yeah. good. I'm so glad you guys are into it. Yeah, I think, um, so Stacy introduced me to Tell Me Lies, which sort of led me down a path of reading more psychological, um, <laughs> so, I don't know if suspense or thriller is really the way to describe it, but there is, there's definitely the page turning aspect of it and it has some um, shocking moments. Uh, and yes. one of the things that um, I know I was talking, I, I started to talk to um, Carola about um, a little bit before was um, just like little droplets of the lives outside of the characters that brought them to where they are that made everything feel very real. Tell us a little bit about what Too Good to Be True is about and why you decided to write it. Yeah, so Too Good to Be True is much more of a psychological suspense than than my first book, Than Tell Me Lies. Um, it is the story of, of kind of like a, a twisted, toxic love triangle um, between three characters. Sky, who is a 29 year old girl living in New York City. Um, she's working in book publishing and she suffers from OCD. And she's had like a really unsuccessful love life thus far. Um, and then Burke is a man in his four, like mid forties, um, who you you kind of discover from the beginning of the book that, like it, the the beginning of the book starts right when Sky and Burke meet, and um, they very quickly get engaged. They have a, you know, Burke sweeps her off the kind of romance, get engaged after six months. Um, so it's the two of them. And then Heather is the third character who is also, also in her 40s. Um, and you find out also like right away in the book that she is married to Burke. Um, but Sky doesn't know this, of course. And, you know, Sky has no idea that Burke is married. And it's about the three of them and this kind of twisted love triangle um, that they get themselves into. And um, similarly to Tell Me Lies, I rotated perspectives when I wrote the book. So each chapter is like a revolving, it works in like revolving perspective. So the first chapter is Sky, like from Sky's point of view. And then the second chapter is from Burke's point of view. Third chapter is from Heather's point of view. And it rotates like that throughout the course of the novel. Um, and, you know, it's, this book is hard to describe without giving too much away. So I, that's kind of like how I like to start it. You know, it's about the three of them in this toxic love triangle, but then there is um, part of the book that like delves into Heather's past and you kind of find out about she and Burke's early relationship. They were high school sweethearts um, from the same kind of like poor town in upstate New York and you find out what, what happened between them back then and why 
like how their relationship kind of progressed from there and why they ended up in the situation where they are today and like why Burke is having I don't want to say an affair because he's or why Burke is um in a relationship with two women at the same time so the, the book sort of reveals itself as you as you read it's really great um in a way it's like that Rashomon type story where everybody has their own point of view which is true but what's really happening unfolds before us. Yes. Yes. And I love, I'm very interested in perspective. Um, you know, you'll, as you know from Tell Me Lies, that was a big part of Tell Me Lies too. I just think that even in, in life, like the, we're, the way that different people see the world and the way that different people see the same situation is so fascinating to me because the same situation can look so different depending on like whose eyes you're looking at it from you know of course so i wanted that to be a big part of i want a perspective to be a big part of too good to be true and i know stacy will agree with me because we've endlessly talked about uh stephen and lucy and tell me lies um it was very always very interesting because lucy was you know, she had her past hurt and she was very, very vulnerable, but very earnest in the feelings she was developing for Stephen. I, it's just, it's very interesting. The characters are very realistic. Was, you know, in Skye's perspective, she's so genuine and it comes through beautifully. You know, this is um, somebody who has everything and is just so genuine in her feelings that you almost wonder if she's too good to be true. And, you know, with Lucy, you see the relationship. I mean, you know, you get to college and you start to try to date uh, and you see it from her point of view where immediately, like, you want to shake her and warn her about um, Stephen and be like, don't you see what he, like, come on. Like, you know, I know you're 18 and young, but it's right in front of you. But I guess because of everything else and because of how, you know, young and idealistic she is, she's um, not aware. But with Skye, I guess there are red flags too that her friends kind of try to show her, but you know, it's a different situation. She's an adult already, you know, she's 29, she's had a career, she has her problems, which probably make her more likely to jump into a six month engagement. But it's, it's very different because where Steven is just kind of awful. Yeah. Um, Burke is not, he's making her breakfast in bed you know not he's, like he's very sweet and caring very but i, I do want to mention because you said how how sky is like you know more mature and everything at 29 it's just interesting because like slightly recently we were talking and by we i mean me and my husband like this was probably like around thanksgiving or a little beforehand of how you know your brain doesn't really mature until you're 25 and yeah yeah and to me i was just like very true and I you always hear girls are more mature than guys and all of that and as I'm reading as I read um tell me lies and as I'm reading the new one too good to be true it's kind of just interesting to see the different perspectives of the females versus the males of it but I I do think that yeah. kind of Sky and Lucy sort of have like they're both still young and I say that as I'm like I'll completely age myself on this podcast but <laughs> um, I'm 32 and I still feel like I would do similar things to kind of both of them, but especially, I guess I'm more relate to Sky since she's closer to my age. And, and I have to just kind of throw in here, like kudos, mad props for depicting a form of OCD that is not clean and neat OCD. I don't think I yeah. have the only the only one and it hasn't been pointed out it hasn't been specifically depicted you know said as OCD the, the closest I could think of is um, that old Twilight Zone episode Nick of Time where William Shatner is obsessed with the fortunes he's getting which is to me reads as an you know a lesser lesser um thought of version of OCD, but I was absolutely blown away that that's the route you went because I don't think a lot of people who don't, who understand OCD or know, think they know what it is, know that it comes in forms like that. 
Yeah, totally. And, and that's you, cause when you think of OCD, yeah, you think of just like everything needs to be squeaky clean, mm -hmm. like from in that way. But, um, no, there is this whole other side to OCD, which I did a lot of research on, which is like compulsions and having the compulsion to do something. And, um, so I was thinking like, I knew I wanted Sky to have something that she like, that held her back and that like she made her like, that she suffered from. And so I, I started thinking more about like, what would that look like if somebody had this really severe kind of OCD that came with these intense compulsions that like, just really got in the way of, of them living their life. And so that's, that's kind of how that came into play. Um, but yeah, it, it, it was fascinating to like do some research about it and, and write a character like that for sure. And I haven't, yeah, I haven't seen that much elsewhere either. Yeah, it's really, and another thing that I loved about it was that you showed how it really could um, be tied to grief. Mm -hmm. uh, at, yeah, which, that was really nice. That was a really well done um, thread. <laughs> and also just how, you know, because another way that I see it depicted a lot is, you know, it's quirky and like with Monk, for instance, who was um, a character who has OCD that was on television for a while and also has a book series about him, like you can tell that it, it affects his life, but also he's quirky and he's funny and he's Mr. Monk and he does all of these wonderful things. But the thing that I liked about it was that like you showed how it really is something that could destroy your life. It has this hold on you that um, is not funny and people who don't understand it are not like, oh, you know, like at first they might be like, she's quirky, but then you saw throughout poor Sky's life trying to be in a relationship that it became, you know, like a reason for people to avoid her. And she was such a good person. <laughs> It was just a very well done depiction. I thought it was very Thank realistic. You. Yeah. Because, I mean, I have friends that have minor OCD, and it's not like that, which is interesting to see a new perspective. But I feel like, like you were saying, Monk is quirky. It's either glamorized or it's so hidden that it's not really like something to talk about or even like something to read or ingest in media. But this, I, it just, it, it pulled me in and it just, the humiliation she feels at all of it, I, I felt for her. Yeah, I'm so glad that it, you know, like came through that way and that you guys, and that it worked and that you guys did feel for her. And because you never know as the writer, if it's going to, if it's going to sound authentic or feel authentic for the reader. Um, but, you know, I, I am, I am very interested in writing about mental health too. And like with Lucy and Tommy lies, um, I was very interested in like, you know, writing about her mental health and depression and all of that. And so I, I, that's something also that, that interests me as a writer is like writing characters that, that do suffer from something in their mental health because I think that's common and, and something that there's a stigma around that um, makes characters feel a bit more real and relatable. So then you have Heather's story comes in a little bit later. Initially, you know, there's Burke and there's Skye. So you mm -hmm. have Burke and both Burke and Heather have complicated pasts and anything more than I can say than they have complicated pasts and they were living um, in an area in upstate New York where addiction was extremely prevalent, I um, will not say because I think the readers really do have to follow that thread and see how it works out. Uh, but Burke is a really interesting character too. And I feel like it's very easy to, at first glance, once you see that okay, he's engaged to Sky, but now he's also married to Heather. It's very easy to think you're going to write him off as a Stephen, who you talk about mental health has like zero empathy at all. Um, but there's 
a lot of nuance to him as well. When you decided to write his character, did you did you have that in mind that you didn't want it to be as cut and dry? Not that not that what was happening and tell me why <laughs> was so cut and dry, but to a reader it was very obvious a few chapters in that there was like certain tendencies that were almost impossible to redeem in Stephen. <laughs> yes. That's a great question. And and like absolutely I first of all, I didn't want I don't want readers to think I just write these like sociopathic <laughs> men only. Like, <laughs> you know, that I just hate men and only want to depict them as as these horrible people. Um, but no, I mean Stephen is supposed to be a sociopath and I, I knew that I did not want Burke to be that that cut and dry as you put it like I wanted him to have a lot more nuance to his character and it's hard to it's hard to say too much without giving exactly. anything away because you're right like you do like it, it, you could a reader could interpret him as being like Stephen in the first couple chapters but I do all I do, I do say to people when I you know before they read the book like just so you know, I I did not write another Stephen character. Like this I don't is not think the same thing. I don't think that's possible to write another. I mean, like that was the no. first thing I think that jumped out at me when I started reading Tell Me Lies, and I was texting Stacy about it. I'm like, oh my god, this guy is terrible. He's clearly a so so sociopath and a narcissist. But that's but but I do urge readers. No, Carola did not write another Stephen. Uh, Burke is a very a very full character and you really yeah. kind of have to get, you're still going to be wondering when you get to the end of the book, it's not going to be as easy to write him off as you're going to want to initially, if that's okay for me to say. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, yeah, I mean, with Steven, like, I couldn't have written another Stephen because I already did that. Like there's yeah. nothing new there. There's nothing, <laughs> yeah. there's nothing new to explore in that character. Like, you know who he is, you know what his motivations are. I, I mean, you know, what's the point of just writing the same, the same uh, character? Although I, although I will say that um, at the point where I heard he had a cute nickname for Sky, and it was very sweet, Goose, uh, because Goose yeah. mate for life. I was like, oh no, is, is this like <laughs> Steven coming up with a cutesy nickname for every girl? But it was absolutely not. Um, I didn't even think of that. You're right. You, you do seem to you do seem to like the use of nicknames because nicknames are for for normal people who have empathy uh, a very intimate um, way of communication. Yes, but I, I, I just exactly. going to piggyback on something. Between the two books, the texting between Jessica and I are like, oh my God, this, oh my God, this is happening. Oh my God, I love this. I can't believe this. So I can't, can't gush about your writing and your characters enough. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, that's a good point about the nickname thing I didn't even think about that but you're right that that does happen in both books but obviously they're very Sky different and Burke, Sky and Burke calling each other goose is is very different yeah but that's funny because I didn't even I didn't even realize that I did that but yes I think it's a I think it's an intimate having a nickname for someone is an intimate thing that feels real you know like an authentic and so I want yeah I wanted their relationship to feel real Let's talk about Heather, uh, because yeah. Heather is the wild card that is thrown into the story, um, <laughs> and she is from this depressed town, but she very much wants to be a woman who was born into a wealthy family with a lot of money, and money is no, is no hassle, everything is beautiful. But she has this really thorny situation as a teenager. Yes, yes. Um, Heather is, from the get-go, you learn she's very driven. She's smart. She was born into this town, and she was born to a poor family with not a lot of opportunities. But right from the get-go, like, you know, you meet her in high school, and she wants to get out of there. She wants a bigger life. You know, you learn from, like, her first chapter that she's – 
babysitting for this wealthy family that has is spending the year in Langs Valley, which is the town, the poor town where Sheen Burke grew up. This she's babysitting for the children of this wealthy family. Um, and she becomes kind of infatuated with the mother who has hired her, Libby, and the way that Libby lives. And that is really fuel for her dreams and for her, a lot of her motivations in the book. She wants to have a life like that. Um, she wants to get out of Langs Valley and, and have a better life. She's very motivated by money. She wants to get rich and basically just be like a rich housewife. She wants to be Libby. You know, she wants, she wants to be Libby. She mm -hmm. wants to be Libby. She like on one, on one hand, you have somebody like Sky, you know, who was born into privilege and has all of this privilege, but she's a really genuine person. And in the beginning, it's not that Heather doesn't have genuine. I mean, she has, there are, there are things about her life that are very genuine and very genuine feelings she has about certain people in her life. But she also, you know, envies so much because she's never had it before. So it's a very interesting divergence between these two young women who both love Burke. It was really just great. And the, the way that it unfolds is something that I'm not going to talk about because <laughs> this is the point of spoilers. But I think it's listeners wonderful. beware. You are you are such a good writer. Um, so are you are you working on anything new at the moment? Yes, I am. Um, I so my book deal for Too Good to Be True was a, t a two book deal. So I'm contracted for another book with St. Martin's, which is exciting. So I have been working on that, um, and I. I wrote a first draft of it when I was pregnant. I was like very motivated <laughs> to finish that draft when I was pregnant because I was like, I know that when my baby is born, I will have like so much less free time, at least in the beginning. So I finished a first draft of something new over the summer before my son was born. And I've kind of like just started to get back into it in the last month um, editing. The editing process is going a little bit more slowly than I would like with a three-month-old. Um, I can't really say too much about it yet because it's only a first draft and it, it could change a lot, but it, it's similar to, to Too Good to Be True in that, it's, in that it does also involve a love triangle um, and it has that slight, slight like psychological thriller bent to it. Although I would say with this book, it's like, Tell Me Lies had that psychological thriller bent to it, but I would say less so than Too Good To Be True. Um, mm -hmm. Too Good To Be True is much more of like a true psychological suspense. The third book, I feel like has a little bit less of that than Too Good To Be True and is a little bit more about like with the relationships in the way that T Tell Me Lies was. Too good to be true. It's a lot more the traditional psychological thrillers. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know what genre you would even call my books or you'd call that because I, I like to write, I do like to write books that have that psychological suspense element to them. But I also like to write books that have, you know, really like, like that, that have characters that hopefully feel real and that are relatable to the reader and whose relationships are very, you know, rich and vivid and, and relatable as well. So I don't, I don't, you know what I mean? Like, I like to have some of that. I don't, I don't want to say like literary aspect. I don't know if that's the right word, but just a little bit more, a little bit more to the characters and to the relationships in the book than I've seen in some like super traditional like thriller mysteries, you know? Absolutely, because we read your books and we love them. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, it's it's more than just realistic fiction because they, they do come to life very easily. Like, you know, being like, I know people just like that, like the friendship between Skye and her friends, I'm like, oh, oh my God, yes. that's me and my college friends. That legit yeah. is us. Especially when you talk about in the beginning of, um, 
Sky and Andy, like, you know, like out of the foursome of friends, the two of them bonded closer. And I'm like, 100% college friends right there. Shout out to Binghamton. And no, it, it just, it's great. The, the, cause like some characters you love and you love to hate and do all that. But I think it's, you know, it's a testament to your skill that you really are like, oh my God, this is like real people. I know people like this or I am like this. And it's, it, yeah. it's, it's so engrossing and you get so pulled in so quickly. It's fabulous. So Thank ha- you. have you, like, did you spend any time growing up on Long Island? Because this is something Stacy and I have talked about endlessly, um, especially because Long Island comes into play a lot in Tell Me Lies. And then also a bit in, um, in Too Good to Be True. Yes, it does. Um, especially in Tell Me Lies, for sure. So, and you guys are both from Long Island originally, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Syosset and yeah. Jericho, respectively. <laughs> um, so I, I'm not from Long Island. I'm from Westchester. Um, but I had a really good friend, still a really, a very good friend of mine from college, like probably my best friend from college, um, who grew up in Locust Valley area. And like throughout the years through college and kind of in our twenties, I got to be good friends with a bunch of her friends from Long Island from growing up um, because we were all living in New York. And so I would, I would go out there like during the summer for weekends and um, sporadically. And I just, I loved Long Island. I always had so much fun when I would go out there with her and um, I felt like it was, it was kind of similar to where I grew up, except that it had the water, which I loved. And so when I was thinking about where I wanted Tell Me Lies, well, where I, where I wanted Lucy's character to be from and where, you know, where, where I wanted Lucy and Steven to, to be from and first the book to, to take place. I I don't know, Long Island just felt like the natural choice because it's, it's similar to what I know from growing up in Westchester, but it's a little bit different and it has um, the ocean nearby, which I loved. And so I just knew a little bit from going out there so much with my friends. Um, But then I also, I did have a lot of questions for my friends who were from Long Island about like, you know, where would Stephen be from? What town in Long Island is a little bit less wealthy than say like Cold Spring Harbor where Lucy's from? Like, and they said, oh, we should do Bayville. Stephen's from Bayville. You you made me more. laugh when you were talking about how like, and, and this is not a knock to Bayville because I have several friends from Bayville, but you did make me laugh, uh, you know, when people were like, oh, he's from Bayville. <laughs> you know, you're, you're going to Bayville, really? That made that really made me laugh a lot. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad because you know, I I don't know for sure. I don't even think I've been to Bayville, truthfully. <laughs> um, but I'm glad. Like that's what my my friends who helped me with this part. They were like, yeah definitely use Bayville for Steven's character. Like that's perfect. <laughs> so Bayville is very interesting, and here is why I think it's interesting. First of all, it's I mean, you described it perfectly. Um, And um, I've known several people from Bayville. A very good friend of mine who's a librarian is from Bayville, um, and she lives not too far from me right now. She lives on the other side of the uh, island, Belmore, which is like the South Shore. Bayville is the North Shore, but it's not the North Shore the same way that Cold Spring Harbor is the North Shore. So that was extremely well done. But here's the crazy thing about Bayville. Once you get over to where Bayville is, because you take certain roads down, you have to go through Oyster Bay, um, you can go straight into Bayville or you can veer, it might be, it might be right, I'm trying to remember because it's been a while, to, to Center Island. And Center Island oh. is, it's where the old money is. And like, I mean, like old money, like, and um, it's possible that I know he's not old money, but he's certainly Long Island. Um, Billy Joel, I think at one point might have owned a house there, but it's like, it's a, it's a really weird microcosm of Long Island outside of another one. So 
it took me a while to kind of realize um, that Bayville was not really connected to Center Island. I think I've heard, I think that I remember my, when I was doing this Long Island research and talking to my friends who are from there, I remember them explaining that to me, that, that you have to go through Bayville to get to Center Island. Mm-hmm. And that Center Island is this, yeah, extremely like old money. Where is Syosset in relation to Cold Spring Harbor? west of Cold Spring Harbor. Um, yeah, there are parts of Cold Spring Harbor that actually touch Syosset. And it's weird because it's over the county line, but there are parts of um, Cold Spring Harbor where like you have, it's, it's a rare, rare area where you can have a Cold Spring Harbor address but send your kids to Syosset school and vice versa. And that's not really something that happens on Long Island uh, very much across counties. So um, they're neighbors to us. Mm-hmm. essentially yeah that's interesting i'll have to look at a map um so it's nassau county right is yeah there's nassau yeah. county and there's suffolk county suffolk county takes up the majority of long island nassau county is much smaller but um aside from the hamptons like you know there's I was like don't forget about montauk no, Montauk is, oh, that's true, that's the North Fork, but yeah, Long, as you can tell, talking to Long Islanders, and I'm sure you know, being friends with Long Islanders, it's a strange yeah. place, um, but yeah. I like, I like that you say that Westchester reminded you a lot of it, because I know I consider Westchester, Long Island, on the other side of the city. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I think, you know, I think they're similar, and that they're both Suburb, like you know, there's suburbs of New York, and there are a lot of people who commute or did um, <laughs> yeah. commute from both Long Island and New York. Kind of a similar vibe in Westchester, where you have you have towns that feel more like like the Oyster Bay, Cold Harbor, but then it, you have the towns that feel more like Bayville. You know? And people people generally think of the more affluent areas when you're talking about it, too. Uh, like, if you say you're from Long Island, and I know in the grand scheme of things, even the areas that are poorer on Long Island are, you know, wealthier than other areas. Right. But most people think of the wealthy towns on Long Island, and they don't realize the disparity. And I think that there's a lot of similarity. You know, they probably, the suburbs grew around the same time um, because of proximity to the city. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. But, we, but we think that you write Long Island perfectly. Thank you so much. And I mean, and they're so close, too. Well, I live, now I live in Darien, <laughs> Connecticut, um, but it sometimes will take they have like a, a regulator, um, just like motorboat, and sometimes we'll take the boat out and it's so quick to get to Long Island. I mean, it's like 20 minutes or something just to go right across the sound. Yeah, yeah, it is. So it's all it pretty close together. I mean, driving, it would take a lot longer, but. Because your stories are just, to me, they seem so meticulously woven do you spend a lot of time planning? Are you, I guess, like, we recently learned the term pantser, which you fly I was by the gonna seat say of your pants. Um, or are you a planner? Because if you're a pantser and you're able to make everything work as well as you do, my hat is off to you even more so. You said pantser? Pantser. Isn't that a funny word? Yeah, like fly by the seat of your pants. Oh, yeah, that's funny. I've never heard that before. Yeah. Um, I, well, that's a good question, and I'm so, I never really know how to answer, because I feel like I don't have a super clear process, or I, I, in that way, I'm not really a planner. I mean, with, I will say, with Too Good to Be True, I was more of a planner than I was with Tell Me Lies. Tell Me Lies, I was more of a pantser. Um, like, I just kind of wrote that. I, that just that one that was my first book you know it was more personal to me it just kind of poured out of me um I didn't really outline I knew where I wanted the story to end with tell me lies but I didn't really outline the the meat of the book um and then with too good to be true I did have an outline um I wouldn't say it was a super strict outline but and like I I knew Again, I knew I wanted 
the book to end up. I didn't fully know what was going to happen in the middle. Um, but I did have, I did have a vague outline with too good to be true because I felt like it needed a little bit of structure in order for me to write it. Um, but you know, in terms of like all the twists in too good to be true and where they're placed, that is something that, you know, I did not, I do not know before I write the book. Um, that's, I think what a really amazing editor is for truthfully. Um, like I knew what I, I knew what I wanted the main twist to be, but I didn't know like exactly where the right place in the book for it was. So I think like originally the main twist was a little bit earlier than it ended up being in the final draft. Um, so I would say I'm, I'm kind of somewhere in the middle of like a pantser and a planner. Like I, yes, I knew where I wanted the book to end up and I had points that I had to touch in order to get there, but I wasn't, you know, every single chapter, I wasn't like, I didn't know exactly what was going to happen. I kind of just like wrote some of it while I was writing it and was like, you know what, this is what I'm feeling. This is, this is what feels natural to me in the moment. Um, it really, because Too Good to Be True is such a twisty book, it really was like having agent editor step in and help was so essential because I, in a book like that, you know, you're so like in, in it and you've spent so much time writing, you're so like inside of it that it, it really helps to have people outside of it who can say, you know what, no, like this twist needs to be pulled back and move over here. I think it would be really smart if this was another twist that you added. Um, so that, like, for me, it always takes a few drafts to get it right. Well, and it's a team effort. I want to thank you so much for chatting with us. This was wonderful. We cannot yeah. wait to do an event with you. Um, and um, I know I'm going to wait for your third book that you're yes. like in the middle of writing. <laughs> yes, we can't. Yes, we can't wait for anything that you write subsequently. Thank you. Well, sorry, I can't say more about it. I like haven't even my agent hasn't even read it yet. So I'm like, I could send it to her and she could literally hate it. So it's, it's cool. We won't. <laughs> yes. We'll love it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, this has been Jessica. Stacy, And Carol Lovering. And we are going to close this chapter of Turn the Page. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.